Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here and all the way across the border. Um, I'm Sonia Joseph. I'm a consultant in general paediatrics at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh. I'm the Associate Director of Medical Education there. And what that should say is that I'm the battered mum of a feisty three-year-old girl. Um, I also have many other titles, wife, daughter, sister, um, and all of you are professionals, all of you come from multiple different backgrounds, but the one thing that we all have in common is that we will have one of those people in those other roles in our lives who've had to be hospitalised or who know someone who has to be hospitalised. And the one thing that we all take for granted is that the junior doctor who sees us knows what they're doing. They know the system, they know who they need to call for help, they know you know, what medicine to give at exactly what time. I'm going to play you an audio clip from one of my very brave Foundation Year One doctors when they came to speak to a colleague of mine in January 2012. And I remember thinking, there's nobody here and it's just me and a nurse. <laughs> I remember her saying to me, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And it was horrible because I was just like, yeah, but you've got oxygen on you. <laughs> What else can I do? What made me more scared was when you go back and reassess and the patient's not improving after the thing that you've done. Um, I didn't know who to call because um, it was my first week. I can't even remember if you had to even leap at that point. So it's quite disturbing th some stuff really. She's looking after my daughter. She's looking after your mother. It's in her first week. She didn't know who to call. She was really scared. She gave oxygen. It didn't get better. Oxygen in medical school equates to getting better, doesn't it? I didn't know how the bleep worked. All doctors carry a bleep. The hospital switchboard sets it off, but you have to know who to phone. I have two radio pagers, a bleep, two mobile phones, so people can get hold of me wherever I am, but they need to know the numbers to call and switchboard have it. But if you don't know the number, to phone through to switchboard. What do you do? Okay. Terrifying stuff. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, surely that can't really be happening. Can it? At the same time, I, my, my education role expanded and my boss said, Sonia, we're going to give you a golden opportunity. It's always a warning bell, isn't it? Um, the golden opportunity is to review induction across the whole of Lothian for all junior doctors. I took a breath and I thought, right, let's not panic here. Let's try and do a little bit of a little bit of resourcing, a little bit of finding out what's going on. So here it is, Bonnie Scotland. The stats on the left hand side just talk about the southeast deanery. So that means that doctors come to NHS Lothian, which is in, in the blue. They rotate between Fife and the borders. The numbers there relate to foundation doctor, and that means a doctor that's in the first two years of their postgraduate training after medical school. And then subsequent specialty doctors are people who are going to be GPs, paediatricians, intensive care doctors, a &E doctors. And you can see the numbers are quite significant. But what I want you to appreciate that in August, December, February and April of every year cycle, there is a mass migration of these doctors. So all of these doctors will either rotate within hospitals in Lothian, in the blue, and that can be up to six major hospitals and 42 small satellite hospitals, or between the two major hospitals in Fife and the borders. That's a significant number of people moving around. Okay. With every move, they are supposed to come and meet somebody like me in that hospital. So they come to my children's hospital, I stand up, I welcome them, I say, hi, my name is Sonia, this is who I am, this is what's different about the children's hospital. But the problem is, I need to know about them. The managers in all these hospitals, they just want to tick off that you have had your face-to-face -face fire training in Lothian, that you have had your HR documents, you've had all your relevant shots. And if I can prove all of that, then everyone assumes you've done a good job and it's fine. But actually, what happens to all of us when we go to a new, a new job? Even coming here today, how am I going to get there? Where can I park my car? Actually, should I just take the train? Um, what happens if I have to work late? What happens to my car then? How do you work the phone there? Where are the toilets? Can I get something to eat if I'm doing a night shift? 
that's what's actually going on in the junior doctor's mind. And those are the questions that having a face-to-face -face fire lecture or signing off on your immunisations aren't going to help you. So we're all familiar with this. This is a press clipping from a common free paper and it says the sad thing, feeling sick in August? Worry. Best not go to hospital. And actually the clip that I played earlier would reinforce that message because in August there are junior doctors who don't know what they're doing. But actually it's because we're not telling them the information they need. This alarming stat is that 6% increase in death rates in August in that first week. 6%. So if I went in with my daughter, she's got a 6% increase in the chance of becoming sick and the junior doctor at the other end not being able to cope with it. Can that really be true? As a doctor, I'm very proud of what we do. I'm very proud of the, the team and how hard we work to try and deliver care to people. But I can't, I can't st stomach that. I can't hear about the Francis report and hear the 162 recommendations made for the care and the, the just quite frank neglect that happened to those families and, and stomach it and take it. So as part of the whole induction review process, the opportunity that I had, I did a lot of research, asked a lot of questions and I said, well, do you know, what does the government know about how prepared junior doctors are? And this is what they came up with. In 2000, um, they did a, a large scale paper that showed only 4.3%. So four in every hundred medical graduates said, you know what, it's okay, I feel ready to be a doctor. Or maybe I'm not ready to be a doctor, but I just don't want to be a medical student anymore. I want to do what I practice, what I train to do. 2013, this instituted a massive escalation in, in changes to the curriculum in undergraduates, and they resurveyed again. And they said, oh, well, actually, it's a little bit better. You know, 75% of medical students said, it's OK, I feel ready to be a doctor. But in actual fact, they only had a 31% response rate. So they're more than likely to be the people that felt empowered, felt better, enjoyed their undergraduate experience, and are more likely to say, yeah, you know what, I'm ready for this. So what happens in NHS Lothian? Well, 43% of the doctors that I asked said, yeah, you know, I know about the systems. I know about the Royal and the Sick Kids and the Western. I know the differences between all the hospitals. But when I asked the whole group, and I said, you know, how ready do you feel to be a doctor? So you come and see my daughter with me. You don't know who I am. And you take a history and you ask me about her illness and you ask me about her medicines. You ask me about her birth. You ask me personal stuff about my family and the illnesses in my family. And then you make a diagnosis. And then if you don't know what to do, you call for help. How ready do you feel to do that job? And actually only a quarter of them said, yes, they did. Now these are the top 5% of the UK intellects. They've had the best opportunities compared to the, the gentleman that was talking earlier. They've gone to the, you know, they've done well, they've done exceptionally well in, in, in university during various challenges, and yet they still don't feel ready. So there's fun, something fundamentally that we're doing wrong. From the processes of induction and medical education, since 1944, there have been over 20 different pieces of legislation on how you should train a doctor. You know, what qualification do they need to go to university? What do they need while they're in university? And what does their training pattern look like outside? Royal colleges all dip in and say what your curriculum should be. Um, in the, since 2000, 11 of those reports have come out, so nearly 50%. So there's been an exponential rise in legislation of what we should be doing. How many changes do you think there have been in NHS Lothian to the face-to-face -face induction on the first day that they start since 2000? Absolutely none. So 50% increase of what we should be doing, what we should be saying, how we should be training these people. What have we done about it? absolutely nothing because surely what we're doing is fine so i did what i do best which is i thought about the children that i work with and the benefit about working with children is that you can't get away with anything why is there a hole in your tights dr joseph why do i need this medicine dr joseph i don't want to do that dr joseph and inevitably it's no but the main thing is that they ask me questions all the time i have to listen I have to digest what they're saying to me and I have to change the way I communicate with them to try and get them better and to try and get them to see that I as the doctor am there to help them, not just be another person that says no all the time. So I sat down with a group of trainees and I said, right, tell me, tell me about your experiences, what's going on.
And then I realised that because I'm the head honcho, I'm the consultant, they're kind of being quite polite. They're like, oh no, you were really friendly. It was really great. It's like, I don't want that actually. I want the warts and all stuff. I want the stuff that Jimmy in the car park was really rude to you and, and you know, that really put you off your day and then you didn't know where to come because the map wasn't, you know, correct. I need that sort of stuff because that's what's going to help. So I sent my little army of administrators out because they're friendly. Um, they're all mothers. Uh, the doctors see them all as someone who supports them. So I sent them out to go and ask them questions. We sent out an electronic survey. But instead of having marks, you know, one to five on grade your experience, what we actually said was just left massive text boxes and said, please tell us two good things, two bad things, two or three things that you wish we'd done differently. And if you feel passionate or driven enough to say anything else, we're going to listen. I started to think about the information that we were getting. And I started to put it in the context of an organisational accident. So, something major happens in a hospital. This is, um, they use something like this. This is called the London Protocol. And what they, oh, the team of investigators do is they fit all the different things that went wrong in the stage to that error being committed into this framework. So latent failure, management decisions, organisational processes, workload, culture, communication, knowledge, ability. You know, only 25% of my junior doctors believe they have the ability to be a junior doctor. Um, unsafe acts, emissions, probably the most likely thing that's affecting them. Now, this is all supposed to be in the context of a whole department or a whole hospital. But what I thought to try and rein in the fear that I was feeling from the feedback that I was getting from these trainees about what's actually happening at 2am and what's actually happening at 10am when I'm not there uh, because I'm in clinic. I put it in the context of a person. So one of my trainees, they've just finished medical school, which aspects of the London protocol affect them? And actually it's this, you know, at a minimum, management decisions. You know, who do I call? You heard it. I didn't know who to call. It was my first week. I didn't know how the, how the bleep went, the organisation. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. The culture. I'm too scared to phone Dr Joseph. I've never met her. I don't know if she'll be nice to me or not. And that's often, the switchboards will often say that they will, they will get a new junior doctor coming on the phone and they will say, oh yeah, don't worry. We'll call Dr Joseph. She'll be fine. Or we'll call Dr Paul Yunson. He doesn't mind being interrupted in clinic. It's that organisational knowledge. It's that person to person culture knowledge that these people are friendly and they want to help. But how can you give that in the first few days? So equipment, ability, you know, how does the bleep work? I don't know, nobody showed me. I've never had that at university. Emissions, well, the emissions probably happen because we're not teaching them what we need to do. Mistakes, not on purpose, probably just because we didn't show them what we actually needed them to know, which was genuinely how to do their job. The barrier is specifically in that color. And the reason it is in navy blue is that that is the colour my charge nurses wear. They are the army of individuals who are on the wards day and night, along with the consultants and the registrars, preventing mistakes, being the friendly face. But what happens if you rotate to a unit that isn't really got that culture? Um, I met an American woman once during a conference uh, who uh, was a senior administrator in a, in a university and she said, oh yeah, mer medics, you're the only people that eat your own young. And I just thought, oh, my goodness. But she's absolutely right. It's almost like a blood sport. Junior doctor comes in, it's like, right, let's see what we can get you to do. Let's, let's challenge you a little bit. So what we decided to do was start small. The, in 2011, the government set out that all junior doctors should have a period of shadowing, which is four days before they officially start, um, where they can learn from each other and learn from their exiting junior doctor. In February 2012, after running all the interviews, I thought, right, do you know what? I'm going to take a gamble. I'm going to pretend that the Scottish government are actually agreeing to this. They're going to pay junior doctors for four days. And instead of just letting them loose on the wards, I'm going to actually take them for two days. I'm going to get them all to meet each other in a big room. I'm going to talk to them about how to withdraw care and let somebody die with dignity. I'm going to talk to them about how to prescribe. And not only that, how to prescribe safely from the experts that do it every day. I'm going to talk to them about how much blood do you need if somebody's having a major hemorrhage and how do you call for that help? What do you do? 
So we gave them two days of systems-based knowledge with workshops with people who were their equivalent. There were junior doctors, there were registrars, consultants, nurses, porters, administrative support, everyone that they would need to show a friendly face, somebody who is there to help them. We then sent them out to their individual hospitals and we went through something called simulator training where we basically had a mannequin and every single one of those junior doctors, so all 135, got the same cases. How to treat someone who is dying of major hemorrhage, so major blood loss, what to say on the phone, how to call for help. How to treat someone who is having overwhelming sepsis, so overwhelming infection, so their blood pressure is dropping, they're losing fluid, you need to get antibiotics into them. So instead of just giving them a random document and saying, read that, because that also is the sepsis guideline, I made them physically do it. We also made them treat a patient who was diabetic and who was becoming hypoglycemic because they were given too much insulin accidentally. So instead of getting them to read the policy and tick it off that you've read it, and that makes me feel better, we give them a giant orange box, which is the hypoglycemia box. We got them to test the patient for glucose. It's a mannequin, so you have to get the verbal readout that from the fake nurse that it's a low glucose. And we made them administer the medication. Now, is that the same as real life? Of course it's not. But if they can practice that in a safe environment with trainers who are going to feed back to them and say, that was really good, well done, you remembered that, you called for help appropriately, next time please remember to screw the lid onto the glucagon bottle better, inject the water in because that's the only way you're going to get the medicine. It's amazing all the little things that can make the difference to treating a patient. We subsequently moved on, we ran the programme, we made them do a module that I developed which had the same video cases and again it was the same three things, treating major hemorrhage, treating an infected patient, treating hypoglycemia, but I asked them systems based questions and it, all I said is you can't fail this, all it's going to do is just test you to see if you remember the things that we taught you in the first two days and the things that you've practiced on the third day. And what, they, I came across a lot of backlash from people, what's the point in making them set a test if you're not going to fail them? Typical medics, eh? Have to pass, have to do well, have to be in the top 5%. But actually, there was plenty of point because the same trainees that were having difficulties who had to reset the, the video screen again and again are the same trainees that asked the slightly odd questions during the workshops where the teachers and the trainers and the administrators who were showing them around went, they're just not getting it. They're a bit confused. They're not going to really manage on the wards, we're going to have to help them long before they touch a patient. What we then subsequently did, and what we're planning and what I'm currently in the middle of, is embracing modern technology, dragging my, um, my colleagues into the new world and saying, right, we're going to have an internet page. My God. It's going to have videos from current junior doctors saying, these are the three things that you need to know about this job. Mr X needs this form filled in for this operating list on Thursday. Sounds really simple, but it will be a massive benefit for the trainee on their first day. There's going to be videos of people like me just for a minute, just enough to keep your attention. So I've already talked for too long for you guys, but just a minute that says, welcome. These are the cases that you're going to see. This is my expectation of you when you come to work for my team. We're going to make an agreement with Fife and the Borders about the training that all our doctors receive so that you don't need to set the fire lecture again when you come to see me if you've had it at the Borders because fire is fire. We have to work together, we have to stop this repetition. Instead of eight hours of mandatory training on HR policies, manual handling, which Fife have given and then now I'm giving, wouldn't it be much more beneficial for my patients to give them a welcome from me and seven hours of systems-based testing, practical knowledge and practical case-based learning to empower my junior doctors to care for their patients. So I'm in the middle of phase two, we ran phase one, we learned from the feedback from our trainees, both face-to-face -face feedback and electronic feedback. We changed the program for August this year. And I'm pleased to say that based on the feedback that we've had, we're only gonna make a few tweaks because they've genuinely enjoyed it. They've genuinely learned a lot and a miracle has happened. An absolute miracle, something which I never ever thought would actually happen because somebody said to me once, supervision is patient safety in the here and now and medical education is pa patient safety for five to 10 years to come. 
But what we've seen from our experience is that medical education, tailored education to the needs of the people that you are training, has actually produced a benefit for patients now. This slide is complicated. However, this slide completely changed the way I felt about what my team had had to go through. So what this shows is the number of episodes of hypoglycemia, so dropping your blood sugar, that a diabetic patient goes through. The diabetic team collate how many episodes there are from all the different patients on their wards and how well they were treated. And what this slide actually tells me is that in the space of time from August to March 2013, there was a 50% increase, so improvement, in the number of patients that were treated appropriately by a junior doctor with hypoglycemia. Now, the thing that's most important about that is that during that time, we had the worst outbreak of a virus called norovirus. And so there had been a 90% increase in the number of episodes of patients coming in with hypoglycemia because they were acutely unwell. So during a time of acute stress on the patient and on the system, because of the number of people coming in, the junior doctors not only stepped up to the mark, but they treated the patients appropriately. They recognised the low glucose, they recognised the impending danger on the patient, and they treated it. On top of all of that, I had I tentatively sent an email out to various trainers around Lothian, and I said, just wondering, we ran the programme for the first time, August 2012, any comments? Send. And, oh dear, please don't shout at me. And what was absolutely amazing is the amount of positive feedback that we'd had. We'd had a, a, just a, a landslide of emails beforehand about how dare you, who do you think you are, nothing like this has happened, I can't believe you, this is nonsense. And then afterwards, I had an inbox full of people going, I did a ward round and the junior doctor knew which forms to fill in. They knew how to prescribe. They'd asked the right questions for my family. The best one of all was I did a, a ward round and there was a major hemorrhage on the ward and the junior doctor instituted an appropriate assessment, appropriate initial treatment and actually made the call when other people didn't because they recognised the drain filled with blood underneath the bed and they saved that patient's life. Now, that doctor was probably exceptional. However, that is a change and that is a change that a whole group of trainers and doctors across Lothian feel is related to direct education and direct targeted training, answering the needs of our own trainees because their same voices told me in February that they needed this, they want this, they don't know what to do about this, so we've tried to help. The other thing that we do is we run a prescribing test at the Sick Kids in Edinburgh and they, all the junior doctors come in, they get a drug chart and a case scenario. And what was absolutely phenomenal is the Foundation Year 2 doctors had never had this training and half of them, you know, they did okay, drug cardex, most of it was all right. I don't think all right is good enough for my child and I don't think it's good enough for your child. The Foundation Year 1 doctors who'd had our targeted training, only one of them out of 12 made a single error in a 19 point test on the drug cardex and that was specifically related to fractions. The rest of them got it 100% correct. Now that is the doctor I want prescribing for my daughter. The, ch the person that got the small error in fractions, turns out that they have a very specific learning disability related to fractions. And we use a lot of fractions in paediatric prescribing because it's all weight based. You take somebody this small, take somebody this big, and you have to prescribe a drug for them. So you need to be good at your fractions. And what we were able to do is, you seem to have this problem, let me help you. Let me help you on the ward round. Let me tell the other consultants who are with you so that they don't shout at you, but they kind of give you the time to do the maths properly to make it safe for the patient. The other thing that came out is that the doctors in difficulty, I mentioned earlier about the administrators who had a feeling from some of the trainees who were going round that they just weren't getting it. During our two day programme, there were four trainees in particular that everybody felt uneasy about. Now in the past, these junior doctors would have been on the wards, practising, and nothing would have come to light. They probably would have been isolated from their group because nobody's, you know, nobody feels they're really doing their job properly. Other people would start feeling anxious and start making up for that person or double-checking that person. But because it came to light, before they touched a patient, 
that they were struggling. We were able to get their supervisors in and their lead consultants in to support them from the beginning, to make sure, to tell the charge nurses, look, you know, this guy's coming. Doesn't mean he's going to definitely make a problem, but just give him a hand here. He might need a bit of extra time with some decision making. If you feel he needs help and he's saying no, just get the help anyway and they'll understand. Teams started working across together. So the blood transfusion nurses worked with the anaesthetists at the Western to make their scenarios more appropriate, more real, more vivid. And the most important thing is what my FY1 doctors, so the new graduates, think of the voice at the beginning of the talk. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not sure what to give because oxygen's supposed to work. I'm scared. I didn't know how the bleep worked. And the feedback that we got from that programme, this is summarising it here. Feel much more confident and feel I know who to ask if I don't know. I think what I'd like to say is that looking at what our trainers need, so what the people on the ground need in your businesses. They'll have ideas, they know what they need, follow the process, your customer comes to the door, you know, has to get a certain product or has to go through a certain thing, follow every single step and you will be absolutely enlightened about what they have to go through and the little things that people say, yeah, don't worry about that, don't worry about that, but you're the boss. You think that is happening because you do worry about it. This whole process has taught me something about the fallacy of centrality. And that's a term that I heard um, during a, a talk that a colleague was given, and it was something coined by a guy called Ron Westrom in um, the 1940s and 50s when he looked at paediatricians who forgot or just didn't identify um, mothers who were harming their own children. And what they realised is that when you are in a position of power or in a position of seniority or the, the boss of a big business, you think that you're at the centre of it. You think you're steering it. You think you know what's going on. But actually, you're too blinded by it. And so was I. I assumed that everything was going to be OK because they turn up and they say nice things on the feedback. But actually, I was completely out of touch. And it's only when I went through all the different processes in the eyes of my patients and through the eyes of my trainees that I actually found out what was going on and was able to make a change. None of this would have been po possible without all of these people on the screen. We found out the problems. We identified them. Several of the people here are very senior in NHS Lothian and they acted as the shield. So to all the people that said, how dare you, you can't do this. The medical director said, well, we've got to do something. Why can't we just try it? The shadowing week is four days before they even touch a patient. We can at least try it. And I'm really glad he said that. And I'm really glad they supported it. All the other people here are all jobbing on the ground, nurses, doctors and administrators. They gave up their free time to try and support this. And because of them, we've had the successes that we have. And so my final message to you is to try and empower your staff, your juniors, your trainees, your line managers, if they see a problem, to come to you, to try and help you to solve it because you've probably stopped seeing it. Thank you.